change your fortune. Huh? Why, half the crew would be spinning in that black abyss if not for... Look, don't you get it? I screwed up! I mean, for two seconds, I thought that maybe I could do something right, but... Ah! I just... Forget it. Forget it. No. You listen to me, James Hawkins. You got the makings of greatness in you. But you gotta take the helm and charge your own course. Stick to it, no matter the squalls. And when the time comes, you get the chance to really test the cut of your sails and show what you're made of. Well, I hope I'm there, catching some of the light coming off you that day. Welcome to Franchise Killer, a podcast where we pick movie franchises or wannabe franchises, review them film by film, and see where things went wrong. All right. Were you even, that's the mantis thing, right? Yeah. Kind of. You, you kind of got it. Yeah, he's, he's more like, all right. All right. I hate yeah. that guy. All right. I hated him. Uh, Why? Well, so, Cabin boy. He had, he had dumb eyes. Yeah, he was I thought he was kind of cute. <laughs> it's your type. Yeah. It is your type. <laughs> Uh, I'm Reese. To my left is David. Further off to my left, Irina. Across from me, Noah. And flipping end over end, deeper into a black hole, we have AJ. <laughs> I like how he took the time to say his name and introduce it's himself. Like, AJ, he's, like, AJ. he's got, yeah, he's got I, pretty I good spaghettifications going out. on. And today we are talking about Treasure Planet movie that came out in 2002 and is directed by Ron Clements and John Musker. If you are a fan of Disney animation, you should know those names well. They were a big part of the Disney renaissance. Uh, they directed The Great Mouse Detective, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Hercules, The Princess and the Frog, and they closed out their career on Moana. They are now uh, retired. Oh, what they a had some good ones. Good under their belt. track record. They had all good ones under their, <laughs> their belt. I would say, like literally, none of these are bad. Right. Say unless you count Treasure Planet, which I guess we'll find out. Yeah, I guess we'll find out. Didn't didn't Clements uh, and uh, what was the other one's name? Musker. Musker. Musker yeah. Didn't they get uh, admitted into some sort of Hall of Fame for animation? I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, just recently, I think. Yeah, I mean, they deserve all the awards for their contributions to uh, 2D animation especially, but yeah. even even Moana is high up there with the oh, yeah. the recent Disney movies. Maybe my favorite. I, it's, mm -hmm. it's straight up my favorite yeah. new as Disney movie. As far as movie. the new, yeah. 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 And it, it, it kind of like restored my faith that Disney can can pull off the the uh, the modern day... Mm -hmm. I mean, the because the, Frozen had this really... I, I didn't vibe with Frozen. It was it felt contemporary in the wrong ways. Uh huh. Whereas Moana kind of like mixed yeah. the contemporary with some of, of Look, what you know made really yeah. made me like Disney two D animation. You're, you're just gonna have to let it go. No, <laughs> let it go. I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> you can't hold it back anymore. Uh, and uh, this movie stars Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Brian Murray, Emma Thompson, David Hyde Pierce, Martin Short. Michael Wincott, Laurie Metcalf, and Roscoe Lee Brown. And it's written by Ron Clements, John Musker, and Rob Edwards. And, of course, it's based on Treasure Island. Uh, something that Disney is not a stranger to, seeing as how they've made, like, three Treasure Island adaptations before this. They also uh, really like pirates. Yep. Anyway, for those who are new to this show... On this podcast, we first go over our thoughts on the film before revisiting it for the episode. Then we dive into the story, break it down bit by bit, and talk about the more significant moments. Then towards the end of the show, we give our brief reviews and numbered scores, along with an analysis on the health of the franchise and whether or not this film hurt it. So guys, had y'all seen Treasure Planet before this episode? I'm going to go with you, David. Oh yeah. 
I definitely grew up with this movie. I remember seeing it in theaters. We owned it. Um, I, I think there was a point where we had a video game on PlayStation. Like yeah, the original I seem PlayStation. to remember a video game. Yeah, so I, I was well acquainted with this movie, and I liked it a lot. Irina? I, I did see this before, and since the first time I watched it, I would say I've maybe seen it a handful of times. Mm -hmm. So not super frequently, but I can't actually remember my first... Uh, experience watching this. I don't think we watched it in theaters. Yeah, because I have definitely not we seen this We either rented it or um, I saw it at a friend's house. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. I, I have no memory yeah. seeing this movie. I remember the trailers. I remember a couple of the lines, but it's mostly stuff that could most likely was in the trailer. Like the f farting monster. <laughs> 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 yep. Your favorite part. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Noah. Uh, first time I saw this was a couple of years ago, really? actually. I think David had it on. You say a couple of years ago. Actually, I remember because it was a year ago, almost oh. exactly. Well, there you go. Because it was the beginning ago. of COVID. Um, we finished making some meat or something, and then we're, I was like, hey, let's go put this on. And that's when oh, kind of yeah. Disney Plus was a little newer. I mean, it's still new, but it, they had it, like, just launched all these right. old movies on there, or older movies. So it's like, oh, I can catch up on all this stuff. Uh, well, yeah, that was the first time. That, and only time since? Only time until yesterday. Okay. Uh, AJ, how about you? Yeah, so I saw it. I actually have distinct memories of that uh, the holographic map that's um, mm. kind of unlocked on the back of the Declaration of Independence. Um, <laughs> wait, wait. The map on the back. <laughs> Did you watch a Nicolas National, Cage movie? National Treasure. Yeah. Well... <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you were talking about the farting monster. I mean, Nicolas Cage? Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> did, did, did you enjoy about? yourself, AJ? Yeah, so anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have not had not seen Treasure Planet. Um, I do have distinct memories of the trailers and wanting to see it, but never got around to seeing it for whatever reason. So that is a, a, a clean sweep for you with this series, huh? Like, you hadn't seen Atlantis or any of the DreamWorks movies, had you? Correct. Wow. I don't think we've ever had a run that long of someone not seeing, yeah, not seeing any of the movies. Yeah. That is not to shame you in any way, because all these are kind of like black sheep in their you know families of films. Yeah. But well, interesting. Well, even across the board here with us, um, even though we've seen some of these before, there's this general narration where or story here where we just didn't see it as frequently as we would think we did, yeah. you know? It's it's yeah. weird. It's like they were all kind of swept under the rug yeah. <laughs> somehow. I, I did have a childhood, I promise. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I did read Treasure Planet, the book, you know, several times actually. I loved it and have mm -hmm. the like distinct memories of the scene where he's in, where Jim is in the barrel of apples and oh, just feeling yeah. the, the tension there. So that's so you mean Treasure something. Island? Yeah, which, yeah you're which right. is what this is. I, I read your, your thank you. I read Treasure, Treasure Island. Island. Um so yes, I've read the book. Right. Awesome. Yeah, now we might call back to you uh just so you can kind of give a comparison uh between this film and the original source material. Uh just because I'm very curious to see how much this uh hues to uh closely to that book. Um yeah. hey, it's I, Treasure Island in space. With Muppets. But, with Muppets, yes. They are all, like, <laughs> slightly adjusted animals. Yep. <laughs> Not slightly, very... It's just kind of spliced animals, almost. Yeah. Well, fun fact, though, it was actually originally, up until right before lunch, supposed to be called Treasure Island in Space. That I was thought the... you said lunch. Yeah. I thought you said lunch, too. <laughs> yeah. Me launch. Well. Got it. Yeah, before launch. Treasure Island in space. That was what Muskers and Clements wanted. And then they're like, yeah, that's just not what we're going with. Treasure mm -hmm. Planet. That's cooler. Yeah. David, before we get to the story, uh, do you want yep. to do a, a call to action for us? How about I read the story and you do the call to action? Okay. That's yeah? a fair Yeah, you want to try? All right, guys. So, as you know, podcasts are a thankless uh, activity that is uh, born of a lot of work with very little in return. We do love what we do, but we would also, it would, it would mean a lot to us if you enjoy listening to this podcast that you go to Apple or wherever you are listening and give us a good review or five stars 
uh, all of that helps us. It it helps the the algorithm and it gets us more listeners. And that's kind of what we're trying to do: expand our uh, viewer or viewer listenership. Audio, listenership? Yeah, yeah, that's the word. No, viewership still works. Our ship. Kinda. Yeah. Uh, so if if you enjoy this podcast and you have the time, please uh, extend us a review of any kind or a follow or a subscribe. Uh, it all helps. Yeah, we're on Instagram. We're also on Twitter, constantly posting about our episodes and fun facts. So if you like us, help us out. So now we, we switched roles. Now you're like Exactly. Finishing. I'm ending for you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, all right, David, why don't you take away that story? Coming to theaters November 27th. appears to be some kind of map. This is the moment Jim Hawkins had always dreamed of. Whoa, treasure planet. Now, he's determined to go for it. This is my chance to set things right. I don't want to lose you. Make you proud. Robert Louis Stevenson's greatest adventure, Treasure Island, as it has never been seen before. Oh, hands to Satan! Walt Disney Pictures presents Treasure Planet. How cool is this? What are you looking at, weirdo? Yeah, weirdo. Brace yourself. (laughs) On the planet Montressor, young Jim Hawkins is enchanted by stories of the legendary pirate Captain Nathaniel Flint and his ability to appear from out of nowhere, raid passing ships, and disappear in order to hide the loot on the mysterious treasure planet. Twelve years later, Jim has grown into an aloof and isolated troublemaker due to his father abandoning him and his mother. He reluctantly helps his mother Sarah run the family's Benbow Inn and derives amusement from Alponian solar cruising, sky surfing atop a rocket-powered sailboard. One day, a spaceship crashes near the inn. The dying pilot, Billy Bones, gives Jim a sphere and tells him to beware the cyborg. Suddenly, a gang of pirates raid and burn the inn to the ground, while Jim, his mother, and their dog-like friend Dr. Delbert Doppler flee. At Doppler's study, Jim discovers that the sphere is a holographic projector containing a star map leading to the location of Treasure Planet. Despite Despite Sarah's reluctance, Jim and Doppler decide to travel to Treasure Planet in order to gain the funds to rebuild the inn. So this movie... Notoriously troubled production took something like 10 years to uh, bring to the screen. I think five of those years were actually like people hard at work working on this thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because I think it was right after Hercules that they really, you know, rubber hit the road and they were just, okay, we got to finish this, do this treasure planet thing. Well, they were trying to get it. They were pitching it since 1985. Like this has been... It was going for a while. Yeah, but, but they actually started some sort of loose production on it. 10 years prior to this movie's release. Yeah. yeah. Hercules was the last hurdle for the, the monetary gain they had yeah. to uh, right. check off. And, and with Hercules, it was actually, they uh, Disney wanted them to, uh, Musker and Clements, to direct Hercules, and they were like, okay, we'll direct it, but you have to let us do this Treasure Planet thing if we do. And that was basically like the agreement that they made. <laughs> so like, if you make a decent Hercules movie, then sure. Yeah, like, and they did. And did they. And it, it, this was a thing with uh, Musker and Clements. Every movie they did, it was always like, but can, can we do Treasure Planet? They're like, Nah, you're doing Little Mermaid. How about we? Can we do Treasure Planet? Nah, you're doing Aladdin. <laughs> and, and then as a result, th- then this one bombs, which is sad, because it, then it's like kind of reinforces Disney as like you know we were right. Well, but I feel like it's the point that they didn't try hard enough to get conspiracy this conspiracy alert. There. Yeah, because they're like yeah yeah okay whatever we don't yeah. really want to associate with this thing that you want to do. So. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a complicated um, history to why this didn't succeed. Yeah. Uh, so my question to y'all is, does this movie look like the product of, of 10 years of work? Or does it seem like something that was kind of thrown together? Or does it seem in the middle? Like it's a okay, middle ground? That's kinda... hard to say because when you say it like that, you're like, oh yeah, they were working hard at work for 10 straight years. You know it wasn't just like a it, normal it's like amount of It's off and on work. process yeah. for over 10 years. Or not over, I mean, Okay, the then I'll let say me, it let this me rephrase it. Does, does this hold a candle to other Disney classics in terms of how it just does it hold up against that competition? I would argue yes. Yeah. I make 
also an argument that it does look like 10 years, even if they did it in five. Nice. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, I, I will say the production design on this movie is probably the mm. the best part about it, in my personal opinion. I think mm-hmm. the movie looks really good. It does. Uh, it's good at blending the CGI with the 2D animation, which is something we've talked about with ad nauseum at every on every episode and i'm almost tired of talking about it mm-hmm. but i still have to mention it uh this one out of all the ones we've seen maybe apart from atlantis does it the best it does mm-hmm. uh yeah. so take that for what it is but let's get to our main character here so we've got jim hawkins played by joseph gordon levitt first you've got the kid version of him uh kind of looking with uh, in awe at this storybook that's kind of this come to life uh panorama almost of a ship battle with Mm -hmm. a like a notorious pirate or something and he's like yeah this is what i want to do and then you fast forward to him now he's a bad boy and his mom is like i gotta clean up my son's mess what's he done again i got serious uh 2007 star trek chris pine vibes yeah yeah. um but what do we think about this lead jim hawkins well i love the intro when it came to explaining the concept of what uh treasure planet is it was a clever way to do it without just a normal exposition between characters. Mm-hmm. It was a story that he was told as a child that he grew up with reading in a very cool way. You get to see the very cool graphics. The music is amazing. And then it cuts to him and his mom in almost Victorian level, mm-hmm. you know, it's housing. like steampunk almost. And his mom yeah. looks like Ariel. Is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So I, growing up, I always kind of disliked aloof teenagers Mm -hmm. like the the, i didn't like that representation and maybe because i just didn't get it yeah and so i remember when i first watched this movie i just couldn't relate to his character and i think that's why i wasn't as intrigued by the movie but the strange thing happens where i as i got older and watched it it's it i kind of pick up more nuance with his character in little scenes you know Mm -hmm. That I didn't think of before. So yeah. I, I find him a lot more enjoyable now than I did when I was a kid. Yeah. Well, your daddy never left you, so it's really hard to relate. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And also, I don't think any of us have had a truly rebellious Mm-mm. streak. Mm-mm. So it's hard to kind of identify with that. Right. Well, maybe you M- have, mine, David. Mine's, uh, mine, uh, I had some things in the past. Well, we all had, a re- <laughs> I, I, I definitely had a little minor rebellious year or two but i yeah. would never i never took it to the lengths of jim hawkins here yeah you guys ever run away from home no I just you, do wait you just me <laughs> when i become a teenager i i might be a trouble okay all right <laughs> no. so so how did how did y'all relate to this character i guess david and aj do, do y'all like jim here yeah i mean obviously obviously i'm not the same kind of uh right. troubled soul that he is but i definitely related to the character mm-hmm. i think they did a good job of showing why you know there it went from having him as a, a a kid with wonder and a sparkle in his eye to you know this guy is messed up now there's something missing here and then they they allude to it and they actually later show you specifically why yeah mm-hmm. he is the way he is and uh you know it I don't particularly relate to him, but I was never truly bothered by him. Right. Yeah. I I still can't connect with this character, and I think that's yeah. part of why I struggled a bit with this film. And I just don't, I just don't really like him. I'm not really rooting mm-hmm. for him throughout the movie for some reason. Maybe I need to rewatch it yet again. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I actually like other characters in this movie more than I do I, him. I do differ from you in that regard. Okay. I I was rooting for him the whole time. I just mm-hmm. his rebellious streak I didn't it didn't affect me one way or the other is more what I'm right, getting at. Right. Mm-hmm. So something I do want to pose is that he's not supposed to be like the focal point. I think that he is in front of the camera the most because, you know, he is what's driving the rest of the story. But I think he's just a foil for everybody else and I, I, that's why I was going to ask AJ if that is similar in the original story. Is is he supposed to be like this action adventure star, or is he more just kind of like going along for the ride? No, it's a um, it's a children's tale. It's a I mean, I wouldn't go as far as say it's a building's Roman, but it's uh, still kind of a coming of age story where he's younger. He doesn't you know have the daddy abandonment issues, but he's you know kind of 
learning to be more assertive and and brave and that kind of thing. So those base mm-hmm. fundamental things that I guess children learn on a on a kind of high level concept bravery and I guess sure footedness that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really the theme of the original novel, um, if I recall correctly. So this, I think, I do appreciate that they twisted that and added a bit more of a character depth um, with his origin. Um, but I, like Reese, did not successfully meet him all the way to right. relate fully. Um, but also, like Irina, rewatching it, I do see nuance in his reaction and expression. So there, there is some middle ground, but I mm-hmm. still have some trouble being drawn to his character. Yeah, I, I could have used more to just define him in the beginning. Like, yeah, they go into, like, maybe he has daddy issues, but it's never expounded upon enough, and he's never really confronted with it all that much. Yeah. To where, like, I, I compare this guy to, and I, I made this comment throughout watching it, He's he is like the Star-Lord type character from Guardians of the Galaxy. Right. But mm-hmm. even that character, you you get the whole traumatizing backstory of his him in the second movie not having a good dad and in the first movie of his his mom dying or, or and he does have mommy daddy issues yeah uh, yeah instead of the goo goo dolls montage of him you know growing up <laughs> with his dad and stuff i would have liked to see more of him interacting you know with more like solar sailing and seeing where he actually excels what defines right. his character yeah they um, actually did have um an animated sequence for that. I don't know why I said animated. It's all animated. They had a sequence for that originally, and it ended up yeah. getting cut, actually, of him learning how to build solar sailors with his dad mm-hmm. um, and him building his first one and the development of him learning. But they are like, eh, movie's too long. Cut it. Yeah. So they sent yeah. it to George Lucas and... Uh, yep. Next. They, the rest and of they history. They did touch on a little bit where he does feel bad. Like, he's not just trying to be independent. Like, he does feel right. bad for his mom for trying to deal with him. And so he's, like, kind of pulled in one direction or pulled in two directions he's torn but at the same time he just doesn't care anymore so he you know really is that aloof um yeah so he's lost but i want to see you know what he's actually good at what the potential is for him built up originally yeah i i'm actually in full agreement with you aj i think they definitely could have used that scene that david was talking about but with him building his ships and sending them playing out, off his strengths, showing off his strengths in general, because I, d- his, I don't pod racer. Yeah. I don't think I need to see anything more of his tragic mm-hmm. past. Cause that's not the point of the story, but it would define his character more yeah. if they showed what he's really into and what he's good at. And it would, let his part be more important. Yeah. In the movie. yeah. I think yeah. what's important for a, to get on board with certain characters is to express not necessarily their vulnerability to other people, but there's sort of a vulnerability to the audience. Like you are privy to certain things about this person or character that no one else in the film is. So you get to see some insights, but it's kind of closed off. It's like they created the character and made him aloof towards the audience as well. Mm. You know, so you right. like I can appreciate his character in a lot of ways, but at the same time, I feel like I never got to fully find him endearing. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, all right. So uh, he, he gets in trouble. And just as that's happening, a ship kind of crash lands right next to their house. And this dying turtle looking pirate guy gives, uh, I guess his name's a Do- Billy Bones. Bones. Yeah, Billy yeah. Bones uh, gives him this uh, spherical artifact. And uh, it he learns that it is a map to Treasure Planet. Uh, and then, against his mom's wishes, Doppler's actually on his side to go and find this, this Treasure Planet, go on this once in a lifetime adventure. And uh, they convince her, like, yeah, no, no, no. This will be this will be good for for the both of us. This will be good for your kid, uh, and thus the adventure begins. Mm-hmm. Turns um, out it was. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, are, how are y'all feeling at this point in the film? Ready to go. Yeah, I'm yeah. Hooked. I yeah. I think I'm ready to go. Um, and but I I also don't really care much for this uh, Doppler guy yet. I I think at Ooh. this point I'm still sort of like, yeah, I'm invested, but I don't. 
there isn't really anything that's like, oh, yeah, let's go, you know? Yeah. I'm still mm. waiting for that. Let's take Milo, make him a little older, put him in this movie. He would look like <laughs> his dad. <laughs> I know, I know, right? And also make him side character. Right. But, yeah. I don't yeah, know why so he think... had to be a dog. I mean... Eh, I don't mind that so much. It's just... You know, and that's a different alien characters. Dave David Hyde Pierce. Pierce doing the the voice mm. of uh, yeah. Doppler and like um, Laurie Metcalf doing the mom Sarah. S- speaking of which, there's a in this scene. I I want to bring it up. Um, is this movie has examples of moments that don't fit, and one of them was the little uh, dance he does where he's just like, "Go Delbert, go yeah. Delbert," oh, yeah. and I was like, "That was like- a very." trailer grab yeah like, trailer and, stuff and i think that was a, a joke or a reference that was more popular at the time where you know people would self cheer or something yeah, i guess and like, like that was the, that uh, that felt like it felt so out of place because so it like didn't flossing. even it didn't even Ugh. fit with his character but then they move on so i'm like okay well, that, that's over we'll just you know move on with yeah. the adventure <laughs> yeah that's, that's what sadden, saddens me about so many animated movies when they shove this contemporary stuff that you know is only going to be relevant for it, yeah. Maybe a couple of years at tops, and you know it's just a, a grab for money at the time because kids are like, "Oh, I know what that is." In the yeah, moment, so yeah. then they get more money when the movie releases, but yeah. then long term, it really but dates it. It's yeah. not a it's not a huge mm. flaw. It's just there are little moments like that that sort of pull me out. Oh, they're of sprinkled the throughout. Like yeah. every, every time, I'll say it again. Every time the fart monster comes back on the screen, <laughs> I'm like, "Oh yeah, this is when people were like really into fart humor." Like it was just. <laughs> laughing their butts off at every fart joke. Laughing their butts off? Bet you that's studio involvement. Yeah. I'm I'm all for a well-timed fart joke. Like, one. Mm. But when you're just throwing it at me endlessly, it's... uh, it's it rubs yeah. me the wrong way. Yeah. It's funny because sure. it's one of those things that I'd never really found funny even as a kid, but I was mm-hmm. never bothered by because in my head I was like, oh, that's just something that lives in this world. It's kind of weird, but mm-hmm. there yeah. it is. <laughs> Whatever. He's the equivalent I, to the mole guy in uh, this movie from Atlantis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I. Oh, yeah. Mole. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. God, you had to say it. You had to remind <laughs> me. Oh. All, right, All right, David. David, do you want to continue with that story? Yes. Yeah, I suppose so. Doppler commissions the ship RLS Legacy on a mission to find Treasure Planet. The ship is commanded by the feline Captain Amelia, along with her stone-skinned, indisciplined first mate, Mr. Arrow. The crew is a motley bunch, secretly led by the half-robot cook, John Silver, whom Jim suspects is the cyborg he was warned about. Jim is sent down to work in the galley, where he is supervised by Silver and his shape-shifting pet, Morph. Despite Jim's mistrust of Silver, they soon form a tenuous father-son relationship. During the voyage, the ship encounters a supernova, and Jim secures lifelines of all the crew members. As a black hole forms from the supernova, the ruthless and aggressive insectoid crew members group secretly cuts Mr. Arrow's lifeline, who is sucked away to his death. The ship manages to ride the shockwave to safety, and the crew mourns the loss of Mr. Arrow, suspecting Jim to be responsible. Jim is later comforted by Silver, who knows that Scroop is responsible for Eros' death. Mm, Eros. Yeah. Eros. <laughs> the death of Eros. <laughs> and the, the, the beating heart and soul of this movie is Silver to me. I know, um, isn't it? A really well-rounded character. The, mo- the moment you see him start, you know, kind of showing some affection towards Jim, you, I knew where the story was going, and I was oh, like, yeah. okay, good. Like, yeah. it wasn't going to play the, oh, this is just the big bad, and there's going to be this yeah. massive yeah. confrontation in the end, and he's going to fall to his fiery death in typical Disney villain fashion. No, there's going to be a more complex villain arc here, and mm-hmm. the bug insectoid guy is just going to be your typical villain villain right. that gets dispatched a little earlier. Uh, so I liked that kind of bait and switch where mm-hmm. I thought, okay, this is going to be the bad guy. He- and then there's there's more layers to him. From an animated standpoint, too, he is the most aesthetically pleasing. Although he looks, you wouldn't expect that from a character that is designed the way he is. But Mm -hmm. the way he's rendered is just so well done, Mm -hmm. and the his expressions are so perfect in my mind. Like uh, Jim, like you mentioned when we were watching this movie, he he seems a little off. You know, his face is a little off. Sometimes it's a little. 
Like, yeah. it's it's not enough for me to be, like, really bothered or anything. But for some reason, Silver just looks perfect. Yeah. Like, he, he looks like a perfectly rendered animated well, he's, character. He's more over the top in the way they animated yeah. his expressions, whereas Jim being aloof doesn't allow for much yeah. facial well, he, change. He doesn't, but there's, I don't know, there's just some more life in Silver in general. And I think um the way they incorporated his robot arm is so well done. Yeah, like, and that was a mix of CGI yeah. and practical, but done the right way. I, I want, oh man, what is the, I don't know what the technique well, is called, but there's a certain type of... Irina, do you know what the name of that was? I don't know what the technique was, but I do remember that um, when they were going through this process, they had, Disney has a whole library. A vault. Where they keep, well, the Disney vault is different from the library. The library just has all of their animated characters and sets and scenes so they keep that in a collection and so they went back to find another pirate because they knew they wanted to animate and incorporate 3d but they weren't sure it was actually going to work so they took um sequences of captain hook and then took out his arm and tried to replace it with a 3d arm and then, you know, did kind of like a rendered hand-drawn over top of that. Yeah, a, com- and a composite. So they would play out the scene, and it, it looked practically flawless. So nice. they went ahead with this character. Yeah. From a design standpoint and uh, just from character in general, just character traits, mm-hmm. uh, 100% endorse Silver here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, honestly, his introduction is where I... Like, I shifted in my seat to, like, lean mm, forward. Okay. like, hmm, well, this is interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I want to mention, you kind of touched on it, but how Silver has a lot of life, seemingly. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, Jim is more aloof. I think the point of Silver having all this life is to kind of, like, juxtapose. Yeah. juxtapose the aloofness, and you'll find when you watch the scenes mm-hmm. in which they're together, that Jim has a lot more life yeah. he does. in think, him than whenever he's by himself, you know, just yeah. doing his own he, thing, being that angsty I, teenager. I think he's also there to kind of expose that uh, this life of pirating is not this romantic thing you have right. in your mind, which mm. Jim is like, he's kind of dreaming of being a pirate. And yeah. He, yeah. he has this really rosy outlook of what that type of life is. Yeah. And so when you see Silver, you recognize, or he recognizes that, no, it's, it's a, yes, yeah. there's, there's pleasures to be mm-hmm. had, but it's always at a cost. Right. But in the meantime, I, he finds kind yeah. of a father figure and right. enjoys his time with him while he's there, kind yeah. of like yeah. spending his lost childhood. But My, my point is, there. I don't think Jim looks bad in any way, mm. but I do think that uh, animators were almost more focused on silver because this was going to be the most difficult (laughs) performance to create. He's a mixture of 2D and 3D. Mm -hmm. So they had to make it work because he's a central character. So I think he just got a little more love invested into his rendering. And they would basically, this was one of those first examples where they created a 3D model with uh, just to evoke his mood and personality. So all the animators would look at the 3D model and they would be able to see different angles, especially since these characters are put into three-dimensional spaces. Mm -hmm. So like the ship is three-dimensional, so they had to have a physical representation so they could animate all these kind of sweeping angles and make it look fluid. Mm -hmm. So I think they did that a little more with his character. And then Jim just in my mind, is a little more 2D, you know? Yeah, I agree. So that, that character is voiced, of course, by Brian Murray. Mm-hmm. He does an excellent job uh, integrating with that character in it. There's no, like, uncanny, like, oh, that's that's a disembodied vo- uh, voice actor with right. this character that doesn't fit them. Something that uh, DreamWorks suffers from a lot, I think, even though I like plenty of their films. Right. Uh, let's also talk about Captain Amelia... A character that, by the marketing and how much you see her on the poster and everything, I thought would have more to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's, you know, the captain of the ship. I was kind of expecting 
uh, screen time on the same level as Silver, maybe. Right. Uh, uh, I would argue that it wouldn't make sense because she's not at all any focal point, and he, the two, the relationship between Jim and uh, Silver is the focal point. Well, I so think, it'd be weird think, if she was equal. I, I think what Reese is saying is they represented her more in the trailer right. than they did, yeah. or like more proportionately in the trailer yeah, than I, they did in this. I'm, I'm not right. saying the movie suffers from not having more of her. I'm just saying like I was expecting mm. more. And right. Probably because yeah. Emma Thompson was the voice actress. Yeah. And, and they're and like, she, we got to get her on there. She also does a great job as always. Yeah. That being uh, said, I do really like her character though. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, now we'll get to it. But yeah. I Yeah. And the direction they go with her, I wasn't expecting either. <laughs> with uh, her, her and Doppler, it's like, oh. I was like, that's, right. a, that's a sort of taste. That's some yeah. cat and dog right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's quickly talk about our uh, arrow's death and how annoying this freaking bug creature is, and how much I wanted him to be just destroyed. <laughs> is he is he the Joffrey of the movie for not, a little bit? Not, there, not yeah. that bad. He's not quite as bad as Joffrey. I just because you I, just expected it from him. That's why. Right. Yeah, I, I just hated him. Yeah, I guess if Joffrey looked like some sort of insectoid creature, yeah. um, like that, then maybe. Mm-hmm. What do you mean if? Uh, so. Uh, AJ, I imagine this is just going right in line with uh, Treasure Island. Just nothing different at all, right? Uh, well, you mentioned David mentioned that the captain having more prominent role wouldn't make sense. Uh, the captain did have more prominent role in the story because he was the representation of law and order and, and strict discipline, mm. uh, which rubbed Jim the wrong way. So they kind of clashed a bit. Um, even though in the end, you know, they kind of mutually respected each other, uh, but he is kind of a polar opposite. Well, not polar directly, but a uh, contrast with uh, Long John Silver mm. as far as role models go for young Jim. Um, so, Is this in like but, a movie form or in the original book? This is in the book. Okay. But oddly enough, like maybe it's just because I'm partial to David Hyde Pierce, like Doppler kind of walks the tightrope pretty well with the the cheesy and subtly moving the narrative along and, and driving the pressure of the the motion of the story overall yeah and his romance with the captain didn't really rub me the wrong way even though it's contrived but right yeah um, it's a disney was there, movie was there a black hole equivalent like a maelstrom or something yeah or? so uh that's what i was thinking it's been a while but um yeah it, i they definitely evoke a whirlpool maelstrom type imagery there Interesting, um, and I think with the art style, it's it's important to call out too the I guess the highlight the difference between the CG, like Irina was talking about the 3D models and then rendering it flat, um, and then the deep canvas, which is kind of conflated with CG. But yeah, the best example of that is Tarzan with him, you know, kind of surfing on the vines and the tree right. branches. That's that's mm. a deep canvas, and so that's integrated here seamlessly as well. And they use that mostly just, for like the wide shots of the ship and, and stuff. Right. right. And a lot of the, um, so the ship was modeled 3D and then a lot of the solar sailing, that those kind of things were deep canvas um, and that kind of thing. So they, they really blended that stuff very well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But story-wise, yeah, we're, we're pretty, I'm, I'm on board with it. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, you want to continue that story? Yeah. Next two. Also, Mr. Arrow dying was uh, pretty heartfelt for me. Like Rest that, in peace. Uh, That's a rough way that, to go. Did you feel mm-hmm. anything at that scene? I did. Oh, yeah. Well, especially, yeah, that was they sad. do a good that, job of showing you like all the actions of Jim checking the knots and everything. Like It's just part of the progression, but then we go see the aftermath of the betrayal and that kind of thing. And So it's like, yeah, we're on board with Jim once you kind of follow with him, and then you see his kind of being stabbed in the back. So right. that yeah. subtly brings you in on his character. I, I caught it more on a rewatch than did on the first one, but Definitely. even from the beginning, like I, um, there's there's subtle things that really kind of try to pull you in onto his side, um, more more subtle than it needs to be, I think. But mm. um, yeah, it's they, weird how they have a lot of good super details. subtle in a lot of ways because normally I, Disney's not. I don't know. I would say this movie has a lot of character depth. Yeah, just in especially. Silver and Jim. Yeah, oh, the, yeah, the bond between them. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really good idea for them to push that forward. No, and, they they uh, play off each other well. Yeah, and actually, yeah. surprisingly, that's Morph the- is a good vehicle for that, too. Like, you know, just kind of parroting the parrot from the original story, mm. but he actually is physically interacting and drawing Jim in to, you know, kind of 
go out of his comfort zone. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. interact with Silver as well. So oh yeah, and and the well the great point about this is that even though you know that he's kind of manipulating Jim, he you you can still tell that he actually does care for him. Well, and mm-hmm. there's that scene where Mr. Arrow dies and and um, Scroop is explaining how he was lost. And Jim yeah. is like freaking out, and um, you see Silver glance over at Scroop, who's smiling, and he has that death glare. Oh, and yeah. And you can just tell he, he, that like He's a mad. father instinct is yeah, kicking in. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I don't think it's even in the outline that we're talking about here, but it would fit in this section mm. is. When Jim is freaking out and he's alone with Silver and Silver basically is like, oh, crap, do I have to do like a, a, a dad speech here? Yeah. <laughs> and um, basically explains how it wasn't his fault, you know, that he has he's going to have was it light shining off of him one day and he just uh, hopes I that he can bask in the rays. Mm. When it ha- it's one of the most emotional oh, scenes. It's so good. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, it's beautiful the way they describe it. And it kind of yeah. shows the melancholy kind of melt yeah. a little bit on Jim's face yeah. even though he's still sad. I it, yeah. They yeah. they do a really good job of making it just emotional enough to be believable because there are some animated films and even movies that just kind of push it a little too far and too hard on the cheese. Mm-hmm. But this one is enough where it's like, yeah, I give you a little support. That was a little emotional. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Get punch in the shoulder. Yeah. Get on out. Go back to work kind of a thing. And I, I really love that kind of dynamic. It's it's um, yeah. it was really well done in this touching. And this movie really didn't pull any punches. It, you know, first the turtle, now this guy who you actually grew to kind of like, mm-hmm. and uh, it just continues to follow that like, trajectory. Not throughout. afraid to kill people and stuff. Well, you know, it, it puts the story first before mm-hmm. trying to say, well, this is going to be too much for kids. Or yeah, uh, yeah. Did people actually die in Treasure Island? Yeah. Yeah, straight up. I'm sure they yes, did. Yes, straight up. I know it was a kid's book, so I, I just like wanted to make sure. almost always ship stories have deaths. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> no, there's no, no one way. ever dies at sea. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's easy. It's an easy life. Sinbad didn't kill anyone. I'll say that. There's like nobody no. died in that movie. I need more death in my kids' animated movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I, I imagine the original Sinbad story had death. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, yeah, Sin- that wasn't a kid's story, though. <laughs> if it counts, Sinbad killed me. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. With his dashing good looks. <laughs> and his monotone speech pattern. All right. All right, all right well, we should move on. As the ship reaches Treasure Planet, Jim overhears the crew and soon discovers they are indeed pirates led by Silver and a mutiny erupts. Jim, Doppler, Amelia, and Morph prepare to abandon the ship. Jim retrieves the map and Silver targets him, but hesitates, allowing him to escape with the others. The group are shot down during their escape, injuring Amelia, and they discover that the map was actually Morph in disguise. While exploring Treasure Planet's forests, they soon meet Ben, an abandoned navigational robot who has lost his primary memory and invites them to his home for shelter. The pirates corner the group there, using a secret passage Jim, Morph, and Ben hijack a longboat to fly back to the Legacy in an attempt to retrieve the map. Scroop, who is guarding the ship, becomes aware of their presence and attacks. When the artificial gravity is disabled during the struggle, Scroop attempts to cut Jim loose of the ship, but Jim succeeds in kicking him overboard. They obtain the map, but upon returning, they are caught by Silver and his crew, who have already captured Doppler and Amelia. Whoa. Ben. It, ben almost, like, single-handedly destroys this movie. Mm. So, uh, how long in the movie are we before we meet this primary character? We're at least like at the end of the. the it's like seventy. Act. It's yeah. like seventy-five percent. Yeah, it's weird. It's well, a main character that they just wait to introduce. Yeah. Well, two points on that. To their credit, that's how it was in the original novel. Mm. Um. So I guess you know, without changing the whole story structure, they were kind of tied to that. Yeah. But we mentioned how the marketing, you know, the trailers kind of gave away. Uh, ben was heavily featured in the marketing. So they pretty much showed you this character who's supposed to be like a, a twist or a secret at the end. Like the whole trailers or all, a lot of the marketing involved him heavily. Yeah. The yeah. marketing, uh, the only marketing that there really was gave away a lot of the movie. Right. Not even just yeah, Ben, it, but it, all of it, the, it misrepresented the, sort of spoilers. the movie. Yeah. I, I, I just find this character to be like borderline Jar Jar Binks annoying. Yep. I, yeah. Like, Part of it is just I I can't really think of a moment that I've absolutely loved Martin Short 
you know, just ad living yeah. in a film. Yeah. I, I don't know if he that's necessarily his format for me. Like he was in a Prince of Egypt too. He was mm-hmm. one of the priests, you remember? Yep. But in this, it's almost like they gave him too much free reign with his um, improv. Level. And I, as much as I dislike Mole, at least all the other characters were aware of how disgusting and annoying he was. Like yeah. that that's the only saving grace is that, oh, they're aware. Any He's character annoying. that just has to shout everything yeah. to me is like, okay, if you're going to be a shouter, at least like say something interesting or do something mm-hmm. else that's interesting. No, this character just yeah. shouts at the top of their lungs, almost like yeah. getting them in, uh, in trouble. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, so I'm almost thankful that, well, I'm pretty much thankful that he wasn't there for the entire ride. Otherwise, he would have killed the taken away early. the thunder of, uh, or the, you know, our enjoyment of mm-hmm. Silver and Jim's relationship, essentially. Yeah. It's the real reason Flint ripped half his head off. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Jesus, Ben. And, and, just shut up. <laughs> and I, I didn't mean to, you know, cut out this whole big portion and go straight to Ben. Right, but, right. But uh, you just we, wanted to get it out yeah, of the way. <laughs> uh, we've got a mutiny on our hands. Uh, yeah. What did y'all think about this development where uh, Jim is kind of, you knew this scene was coming where he's just hiding and he overhears like, oh yeah. no, uh, Silver is bad and uh, they're planning this mutiny. And you know, the, the whole thing, you, you know Silver isn't, acting completely himself around that crew. He's right. just trying to... Saving face. Save face. But yeah. Jim, of course, doesn't see that. He just sees exactly what he... Or he hears exactly what he hears and takes that at face value. Uh, so there's a kind of a misunderstanding that there, even though uh, uh, Silver is still a bad guy. He's kind of not as bad as he's coming off right. in this scene. Uh, but yeah, this st- uh, starts kind of the main conflict of the film, and it's... Uh, you start to believe again that, oh, maybe Silver is going to end up the big, big bad again, but right. it, there's going to be some wrinkles to it. Um, like, maybe he won't fully redeem himself. Maybe he'll still do something that's he wouldn't have done before, but maybe, I don't know. It, it, that's what I was thinking it, at this point. Well, it went a direction that was more intense than I expected, because when, when he confronts Jim, when he goes back for his eyeglass... Yeah. Um, basically, you see him changing his hand into a gun behind his back. You're like, "Oh snap! He's gonna is he gonna shoot him?" Yeah. And mm. and then, but meanwhile, Jim grabs a knife and stabs him in the leg to run away. And you're like, "What? Yeah. This, yep. this well, is yeah. way more intense." I think they, to some degree, you can argue like, "Oh, this is predictable," or like, "I know what's gonna happen," or if you know the story, you know what's gonna happen. But from the standpoint of someone that um, doesn't know treasure island very well i think they built up his character and you're questioning whether he's going to end up good or bad in the end is uh very well done because they establish that with in my mind a conversation he has with jim where jim asks him so uh how did that happen basically gesturing to his leg and you know his Mm -hmm. uh prosthetic arm but he says oh you give up a few things chasing a dream. So you're like, huh, how far is he willing to go yeah. to just get what he wants? Because yeah. he's already sacrificed actual limbs. He's like basically half, yeah. half cyborg right. at this point. So I, I think it's, I I do really like that. And I don't really see that in a lot of animated films. You don't see that kind of character struggle yeah, where it's like, a, he's a good guy, but also a bad guy. Yeah, his dichotomy is actually pretty crazy because mm-hmm. you see the internal struggle on his face in scenes. It's mm-hmm. not it's not very flat. You you see yeah. when he's actually wanting to do something bad, but the, the soft spark... Soft, S- soft spark. <laughs> the soft spark for Jim uh, <laughs> comes into play, especially when he goes to shoot him. Yes. Right. And right. he like pulls away at the last second. Oh, I love the way they do his eye. And yeah, the like, micro the, expression so there. Weird. Just like, yeah. They, you can mm. manage to make something that is a bit of technology have emotion. That That is so cool. Yeah. The fact that he, you know, pulls away, that was directly following that scene where he's hiding the gun behind his back. Right. So yeah. they were emphasizing the point that even though he was pulling out that gun, he was not going to kill him. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I would argue that he didn't even know if he was going to kill him or not. Like yeah, he yeah. wanted to because that was his instinct because he's like, no, I'm going to get my dream. But then yeah. when it came down to it, 
he had to make a decision and he's like, crap, I can't do this. Yeah, exactly. I don't even think it was that. I think it was just this knee jerk reaction because it's something he had done in the past. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just like, like I have a knee jerk reaction to shoot the person that I, I need dead. <laughs> in, in my yep. way. Yeah. But mm-hmm. uh, the, after that knee jerk kicked in, he was like, no, I don't, I don't want to shoot this person. What am I thinking? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I got from that. Yeah. He's like, I can't do this. It's my son. <laughs> yeah. Jimbo. Uh, all right. We meet Ben. Yeah, we get, I already got through the uh, Ben we stuff. We talked about our feelings. They've got the map. I Aside from Ben being annoying, I do think his character is pretty well done. Like, uh, he was completely 3D rendered, and they talked about that being a huge process, and... I think there was a decision they made that was absolutely crucial for him actually fitting in this film, and it was the fact that they wanted him to move like a 2D character. So they specifically made his um, metal parts and mouth and eyes and stuff kind of... uh, they had an ability to kind of fluctuate and change the way 2D characters do. Well, it's that same... A technique that I yeah. can't, I don't know what it was called, but it's a, it's used in the Iron Giant and it's used here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's like flat. Yeah. Uh, they're taking CGI. the, they're like, taking the 3D and they're flattening it to an image. And then I think they texturize over it to make it look more 2D. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yes, the, the actual creation, the, the look and how this character moves is a success. Mm-hmm. I just hate the voice. He would fit yeah. into that robots movie they did back in like 2005. Oh, yeah. It was just called robots. Yeah. Robots. Yeah. yeah. Talking about uh, Ben, I don't know if this makes it better or not. For me, it made it better, but I always got the feeling that he was supposed to be annoying. Yeah. yeah. Not He wasn't supposed to necessarily just be a character that, you know. Well, well Jar Jar was supposed to be annoying. Okay, but that's like a more serious movie. Or it's supposed to be a more serious movie. Yeah. This... This is kind of he. This guy's in a different sort of role, and he's in a smaller amount of the movie, so it bothers me less mm-hmm. than Jar Jar. Yeah. But uh, I I think of this guy as very similar to if you ever played Borderlands Claptrap. Yeah, look, uh, I haven't. But that guy always is a. It, it's like this robot that guides you and kind of insults you along the way. But, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but it, it, he he's obnoxious and uh, he's meant to be obnoxious. So right. you just gotta deal with it a little bit and get through the uh, yeah yeah disease. because he's he's crucial to the plot but still yeah. obnoxious. I don't know. Ben just kind of reminds me of Dobby. You know, it's like oh, he's yeah. kind of annoying, but he's supposed to have this. Uh, appeal to him that's endearing that but i, I just don't feel it. I, yeah i i'm actually with you on the dobby one but you can make a claim that dobby was not pertinent to the you story know a yet. lot of people like dobby yeah i'm I, not one of them i'm not either <laughs> i'm not either I, I liked him in some of the harry potter books i think his character got a little better but the only the only thing dobby's there for is to show that guys harry potter is the good guy yeah <laughs> he kind of is i mean if you can be good around that guy Mm-hmm. That moment when Dro- Dobby drops the cake on his uh, aunt. Oh my gosh! Or that was, ugh, I just wanted to <laughs> drop kick him. By yeah, the way, but- I remember watching the movie where Dobby dies, and people were like talking about how sad it was. I was kind of laughing. Me too. Yeah. All right. Now people are gonna hate us because a lot of people <laughs> no. thought that was emotional. No, I, I didn't. I was all like, right. all right, glad we got that out of the way. Get out of this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Moving yeah. back. Now, now so, that all okay, the so basic you, you people can, are gone. Settle down. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was uh, weird. <laughs> not good. Uh, okay, so let's let's move on with the story. Silver forces Jim to use the map, directing them to a portal that opens into any location in the universe, which Jim realizes is how Flint conducted his raids. They open the portal to the center of Treasure Planet, discovering that the planet is really an ancient machine that Flint commandeered to stow his treasure. <gasps> As the pirates prepare to collect the loot, Jim finds the skeletal remains of Flint, holding the missing component to Ben's cognitive computer. He reinserts it, and Ben immediately recalls that Flint had rigged the planet to explode upon the treasure's discovery. The planet soon begins to fall apart. Not wanting to go empty-handed, Silver attempts to escape on Flint's ship loaded with treasure, but eventually lets it go to save Jim's life. The survivors escape to the ship, but it gets damaged and is unable to leave the planet in time. Jim rigs a makeshift rocket-powered sailboard and rides ahead of the ship toward the portal. At the last moment, Jim sets the portal to Montressor's spaceport, and both he and the crew safely clear the destruction. Jim finds Silver below decks, about to escape his impending judgment. 
He allows him to go, and Silver asks him to keep Morph, as well as providing him a, a handful of treasure he managed to save to rebuild the Benbow Inn, believing Jim will rattle the stars. Sometime later, a party is hosted at the rebuilt inn. Doppler and Amelia have married and had children of their own, and Jim has become an interstellar cadet. Jim looks into the skies and sees an image of silver in the clouds. Cue Goo Goo Dolls. <laughs> Uh, was I not? Was I the only one that was kind of disappointed that Flint didn't have some like creepy undead come back to life moment? I never thought about that, but it would have been cool. Yeah, just those. They could could have done something cool with those six eyes that he had, just like slowly uh, coming to life in some creepy mm. kind of skeletal. I don't know. Ho- almost, you know no how they have. No one ha- touches my treasure. They have like these <laughs> mild horror sequences in animated movies sometimes that are mm. it's not scary but it it's like ooh. you're reminding like, me of uh james and the giant peach when they go down to that underwater. sunken uh ship yeah and there are a bunch of skeleton yeah crew that was a creepy people. movie i yeah. love it but it was weird I, and or, also q clayton suicide oh yeah, yeah that was dark yep yeah, yeah like they, disney has their darker moments and and i'm not saying it needed this and it, it was it was kind of cool that he rigged the thing to blow in the end and that's right. how how they go out but Flint, they kind of just teased the, that pirate at the beginning there, and then oh yeah, he just died. Yeah, and that's probably how it was in Treasure Island too. There's like this notorious pirate who, yeah. and they're just out to find his treasure. But mm. this is the sci-fi version of that. I want to take take some liberties in certain areas. <laughs> that's just well, me personally. Yeah, I I kind of like the fact that they stick to the roots a little bit in that uh, regard. Yeah. I think if they had tried to revive him, it just would have been. Almost like an like, uncanny valley the, type here's situation. The final boss All, well, battle. Also, it's Captain like they they they've been following the format of the book the whole way, and then they're uh-huh. like, you know what? Last second, let's just add this. Yeah. For which would be cool, well, but it wouldn't cool, fit. A, a cool me, thing you could do with Flint, though, having him come back, is it would further like emphasize that Silver is a good person because you could mm-hmm. have Flint being like, do you want to live a life of riches or, uh, or something with me, and just let them all go. Because uh, he maybe he needs to build up a crew again or something like that. Mm. I I don't know. Well, the, I'm, I'm my, just, uh, well, my, the only thing is, would be that you would have to sacrifice the scene where he actually saves this. Yeah, life, exactly. I think that that is the perfect scene right. for that. I think well, there's no more perfect than him looking, yeah. holding on to the boat and reaching for yeah. Jim. I think no, the, yeah, no, it's a perfect scene. Yeah. 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 He takes the portal because back the, to Earth, a la oh, John ahead. Carter, and then. Uh, what else? Oh, and then the sequel is Curse of the Black Pearl. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I but, think, uh, sorry. I, I was right. just going to say, uh, yeah, I, I like the idea of seeing more of Flint, but at the same time, it would pull away from that moment of um, just seeing Silver struggle because it's almost like this moment has to be, it has to be so easy for him to just have his way that that makes it an even stronger turnaround. Because if you had some other enemy, it's like, oh yeah, unite a c- against a common evil, you know. But this is like him battling himself, and so I I just kind of enjoy that a, a little better. That's exactly I think, what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. In addition to that, we see in the beginning the the legend of Flint, you know, in the storybook, mm-hmm. and, and is so built up in Jim's mind, and that's what he looks forward to. Right. And as Jim grows and develops in the movie, he finally discovers the treasure in Flint, and it's so mundane and disappointing because right. he's found value in himself. I feel like they could have developed that better um, and hammered that point home. But yeah, there's that honestly, it was just that, a dumb idea I had like off. Oh the no! <laughs> so <laughs> no, I, I completely agree. Where you're coming from is you want to see more of the spectacular in this yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah. So I, and I think it is strongly because like you you get such a strong intro with that character, and then he's just almost more of a non-entity by the end. It's just oh, yeah. there's the skeleton. It 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 does kind of shatter your image of him a little bit. Yeah. And this is also when I'm finally warming up a little bit to Jim as a character. It, it took me really this long to start to kind of like him. Mm-hmm. I didn't ever dislike him, but I'm like, I am a little more engaged with right. with his story, and I do want to see him succeed. And this relationship between him and Silver to, you know, for John, right? Because uh, they have such a great dynamic. Um, but yeah, it, that again, that that scene is 
the crowning jewel on this movie where uh, Silver reaches yeah, yeah reaches for him and, and ends up like oh hell with it I'm gonna <laughs> let the treasure go and I'm yeah. gonna save this kid it's just a lifelong dream I'll get over it <laughs> yeah uh, so good and then uh, Jim kind of returns the favor later on mm-hmm. giving him access to a ship uh, another poignant moment between the two of them I thought at least and right. Morph which we haven't talked about because Morph's neither here nor, nor there for me it's just kind of like a dog but it's a blob right. uh, yeah. gives him Morph uh, so now he's got Morph I surprisingly really really liked Morph yeah. I yeah, expected not to care but I, I really like this sidekick you know for why reason. he doesn't really talk well it's i think he it's more than lot, that actually. well has, no no but not I, know, I know what you mean really he's surprisingly emotional emotional wow <laughs> <laughs> i like the word and it, it's it's almost like he's expressing the emotive nature and there there's something really endearing about the character being like innocent the way a a pet is innocent, you know, doing really annoying things, but you know, it's like, they're just having fun. I have to be patient, you know? Mm. Like, I know he's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> risking our entire lives, but yeah, he he's, doesn't know. It's, I don't know why. I, I don't know if you have any insight on why this character is so likable, AJ. Because it is like a puppy. No, I, I agree with you. He's the intermediary. He's the glue um, between Silver and mm-hmm. uh, Jim that is yes. unspoken. Oh, and it's so a, he he yeah. emotes it in that you know third third party space, right? Yeah, and it and you know it's a, a more successful I don't know animal sidekick type character right. when it does something that would under any other circumstance be really annoying, right? Like pr- disguise itself as the the orb. sphere, the yeah. orb, <laughs> or, but but then you you I actually saw that as like oh a freaking dog would do that, yeah. yeah. Like, yep. that's, well, yeah, Irene and I got a puppy, puppy right. recently, and in that moment we're like, yep. That's him. That's, That's our puppy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's, I, I think uh, what you're saying, AJ, remind, uh, makes me think that it is it is kind of interesting, though, because he does represent sort of uh, Silver's allegiance in a weird way, because he's he if this kind of uh, sidekick is sticking around Silver, Silver can't be all that bad, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, there's there has to be a reason he's invested in both jim and silver at the same time it means there's like something about them that is you know worth sticking around for or being loyal to you know yeah so it, it is kind of like um a you kind of take cues from it onto the nature of these characters yeah so also a connection that i made with it just now um once aj uh, kind of explained earlier that he's modeled after the parrot in the original story is that right Correct. And honestly, Long John Silver with the stump leg and the parrot on his shoulder is kind of the iconic embodiment of what spawned the image of a pirate that we all think of now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, and so I was thinking the way Morph speaks is very much parrot like. I never thought about it until yeah. you said that, but yeah. he only speaks when he's replicating the characters' voices. So yeah. when they say something, he just repeats it. And I'm like, oh, that is yeah. what a parrot would do. Oh, uh, yeah. I thought I said that earlier. Yeah. He's basically the parrot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I also want to comment on the the look of Treasure Planet itself. I think it looks really cool. It's mm. badass. Especially the core with all the lasers no, going through it. I think it I, I just very imaginative construction of this uh I don't know. Treasure Planet. <laughs> it's a, well it's like Saturn with the rings, but you get more of an mm-hmm. eerie green um crisscross like skulls. So well, yeah, talking about the aesthetic of this film overall, um, AJ, do you remember that artist that did the artwork on the covers of all the uh, Treasure Island books? Um, I do like oil painting type. Things? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But the, there was like a a league of artists that um, he was a part of, and apparently they for this film they really really wanted to evoke that feeling so when you watch this movie everything has a bit of a a yellow hue and all of the artwork had that yellow hue and so they wanted it to be very painterly and i think that really does add to this film there's kind of this like almost soft yellow glow on everything that There's creates a lot this. of like spores yeah and it, it reminded me of the the planet in that movie uh, nausicaa oh yeah you seen that? like it really evoked that oh yeah yeah so i think I, it's I nc wyeth it. what was it 
in C. Wyeth. Does oh, that sound yeah, familiar? That's it. I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That Oddly enough, right. he was really kind of adamant about art forms or media uh, not being mixed like paint and illustration. Right. <laughs> but here we have that, you know, counterbalance. But I, I get your point is, yes, the it does evoke that style, the, right. uh, the aesthetic of it. Yeah. Uh, okay, that that's the end of the movie. What what are what are y'all's final thoughts? Any other story points y'all wanted to call out before we move on to the next section of this podcast? Mm. Well, because we're at the end and we get the uh, the second Goo Goo Doll song to sort of send us into the credits. Um, one of the things that I can't believe we never brought up before is the rule that the animators were following to create this. Um, what was it that you said? A steampunk aesthetic. Oh, yeah. Seventy uh, thirty. They called it the seventy thirty rule. Uh, where they use 70% was supposed to be Victorian, 30% was supposed to be um, futuristic, futuristic animatronic, and they used it across the board from the, the houses they lived in to the ship, you know, that was mostly normal looking, but they had solar sails and, you know, jets. Mm-hmm. Um, but even in the music, they wanted 70% to be um, more of that old style mixed with, um, you know, more yeah. contemporary. So the Goo Goo Dolls was representing the, that 30% contemporary. Oh, uh, yeah. I wish it wasn't there. Yeah, I know. Uh, I I didn't mind it so much. I think it um, it didn't clash with me as much as Brian Adams did. And maybe that's just because, like, I I don't really care much for spirit, Brian that Adams. Is for, for the people that yeah, don't Yeah, sorry know. about that. But Spirit had a lot of uh, songs in it. 12 songs. Um, <laughs> but I think... This one didn't really bother me that much because I felt that even though I don't really listen to the Goo Goo Dolls, I didn't didn't really care much for it. I think it it at least matches Jim in some way. It feels like it's a little more his voice than maybe Brian Adams was the stallion in um, Spirit. Mm -hmm. Spirit. And and in terms (laughs) of the emotional content happening in the montage where they used it, I thought it was very effective. But now now picture, if you will, a uh movie that incorporated music better into its scenes to evoke a certain feeling. Yeah, Prince of Egypt, we know. Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh. Oh, yeah. Imagine taking uh, these retro songs that I feel like would still seem contemporary in something like this, and I, I just see it working a lot better. Uh, Goo uh-huh. Dolls can, can I will throw them in the trash. It- well, <laughs> j- just to clarify, and we're saying Goo Goo Dolls. I don't think it was the in- entire ensemble of Goo Goo Dolls. Right. I think it was mainly John Resnick. Okay. Um, just before someone jumps up on us about that. Yeah. Good yeah. call. Good. Thanks. Uh, but I don't think that it would work the same way that Guardians would have used it. I yeah. think that it was supposed to be used in almost just one scene and one scene only, really. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not trying to capture the aesthetic of the retro. Yeah, I have to I have to agree with uh, David on this one. I, I feel like Guardians of the Galaxy was made with those songs in mind. Right. As kind of a throwback and everything else was crafted around it. They might may have had some bare bones story look, points and look, such, but it was kind of... If I really had it my way, I would, just, I would just put the score in there. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Just I agree. Saying, it comes I agree. down Ultimately, to whether or not you like Goo Goo Dolls or not. Right. Ultimately, I agree it with that took, as well. The, the moment that yeah. started playing, it took no. me right out of it. It's a good montage. It's so opposite I, for me. No, it's so I, weird. No, it's a good montage, and I do still like what, what's happening on the screen in that moment, how they're bonding and kind of, you know, getting to know each other. Mm-hmm. But... Just the the music was just it was okay. aggressively yeah. like trying to pull me away from it, and that's yeah. just I, my personal experience. Yeah. yeah. What are you saying? I disagree too? with David because I like Goo Goo Dolls. I've seen them live. Like it, it's not a matter of disliking the music; it's how it's blended. Where everything right. else in this movie is so well blended, that seventy thirty rule is important, and you know the inclusion of that style of music. I get the concept, but it wasn't blended successfully, and so it did pull me out. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mm. Sorry, yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to trash Goo Goo Dolls no. too much. No, you, I don't think you no, were trashing I don't think you them. Did. <laughs> it was just I, I think you were making a valid point there, though. Oh, well, and I, the thing I is, understand I, the point. it makes sense because it, it definitely doesn't always match with the the aesthetic. But you know, I think as a child, especially, and maybe that's why I like it more now. But as a child, I loved it, mm-hmm. and so now I have a very I don't know yeah. a fondness for it. Yeah. And it and it was very emotional in that moment. I the montage hit me actually really hard. Um, so I, I don't know. It, it paired well. Maximum right. props. For any, that. any closing comments? Mm, no, I don't think Come so. I think we can away. move on. 
All right. On that note, let's close out the story here. We're going to take a quick break, and on the other end, we're going to talk about this franchise, give our brief reviews, uh, talk about what the critics thought, and do some box office. So stay tuned. And then what ended it? Yes, unfortunately. Yeah. Welcome back. Let's talk Treasure Planet, a movie that I wanted to call Planet Treasure for the longest time. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, but first on the docket, we've got reviews. Uh, David, you have our scores in a bowl, and you're going to pull those at random, and we're going we're gonna to review this thing. All righty. Well, let's take a look at score number one. We have David with a nine. Right. Yes, I gave this movie a nine. Um, it was uh, it was tough between nine and nine point five for me. I think this movie is, I don't want to say nearly perfect because I definitely see the flaws, but it hits in the right spots for me. Um, there's something about the aesthetic. Maybe I like pirates. Maybe I like space. I don't maybe know. you like yetis. Maybe I like football. I don't know. <laughs> Seven. Seven. Hmm. I'll let you, I'll let the audience figure that yeah, out. Yeah, can we like keep that <laughs> casual? All right, uh, cool. But as far as this aesthetic goes, it hits all the right spots. And I really did like the relationship between Jim and Silver. The sort of buildup of Jim's character was perfect. Um, and in the end, it, I couldn't put this above the other ones I gave it on. Like Road to El Dorado, for example. I think they hit a lot of things better than this movie. But this one, there's just something about it that I think is a better story. Maybe because of the source material, I don't know. But in the end... It, it's equal to the other nines that I give. So, yeah. You've given a lot of nines on this. Uh, three three this nines, film. actually, out of the six. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'm not opposed to nines going for this movie, even though yeah. uh, I might have a different opinion. I'm sure you will. Yeah. Next up is Irina with an eight. Yeah, I love this movie. I think it's great. Um, as a kid, I probably wouldn't have given that score because, you know... As a kid, you're always interested in just the strictly the things you like. And I I was never really a huge sci-fi person. Yeah, you liked I, puppets from yeah, Labyrinth. I loved Labyrinth. <laughs> Rock biters. <laughs> uh, but um I definitely I I would encourage people to rewatch this if they didn't when they were a kid or they didn't see it as that intriguing when they were my age at that time, but uh, it's there's a lot of subtlety in it that w wasn't apparent to me before, and it's worth rewatching for. I a lot of the credit goes to the team that worked on all the visual aesthetics in this, all the work done on these characters, merging the three D with two D, which is not easy. Mm -hmm. I would say that Walt Disney has the resources for it, so I wouldn't, you know, it, it's like they, they have that kind of access, unlike DreamWorks. So yeah. it's, a, it's a little like they have a leg up, whereas, you know, DreamWorks was struggling in that area. But um, I think the reason it's not a perfect 10 is there's a little character development missing uh, from my end on Jim, just yeah. ever so slightly. I do like him. But I just I just need a little more from his character. I'm I'm not really a huge fan of Doppler, but he doesn't annoy me either. Yeah, he's just kind of there. And he's a barely there kind of character. Yeah, I I like Amelia. Um, nobody else really steals the show except Silver, and I think that's the way it should be. I think Silver needs to be the focal point along with Jim, so it it doesn't really matter to me that the other characters are a little lackluster. Um, Ben is just, oof, I don't, I don't know. He, he almost kills the mood for me, but he's not in there long enough to fully kill it. Mm -hmm. Um, other than that, Goo Goo Dolls, not Goo Goo Dolls, uh, what's his name? The Resnick something. Resnick. Yeah. Yeah. He's, it's, it's a little bit jarring, but it's not completely in your face, in my opinion. I think they, they used it for a montage and they left it at that. And I appreciate it. 
So um, for the most part, yeah, uh, still an eight. Solid score. Yeah, I I I really enjoyed watching this movie. Hmm. All right. Funny because my score is a liquid. <laughs> oh. Wow. All right, next up is Reese with a seven. Not as bad as I thought you were going to give it. <gasps> Ooh, I got a glare from Noah. No, it's I did... not a glare. It's shock. <laughs> yeah, I I disagree with him, but you know what? So, I thought he was going to go worse. So what to say about Treasure Planet? Uh, I am just getting big Atlantis vibes from this movie, at least from a quality level, where I, I really was uh, engaged with the aesthetic of the movie and had fun on the journey, uh, mm-hmm. but was missing some of that emotional punch. Uh, this one does have, if I had to give the edge to one of the two, I would give planet treasure, the edge on Atlantis, treasure even though, planet. Uh, sorry, see there, I told you, <laughs> I am always calling it planet treasure. It's because of planet terror and uh, whatever, <laughs> but, uh, treasure planet, I would give treasure planet the leg up on Atlantis because it has that, uh, dynamic between, uh, silver and, and what's his name? Jim, who's a very boring cardboard character until the end. Uh, and when he finally starts to, to be something a little bit more for me. Uh, but I do think, um, uh, I'll say this for the third time, I think Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 does this thing better than this movie does. Uh, especially with, if you haven't seen the movie, spoilers, especially with the stuff between Star-Lord and Yondu, uh, where it's this almost a pirating adventure across space and the moment yondu kind of sacrifices himself to save star lord and he gives he drops that comment Mm, about like uh, (laughs) i may not be your your dad but i'm 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 your daddy or something may not be your father but but i'm your your daddy daddy. like that made me that made me cry and this i know one didn't like (laughs) if it had had pushed (laughs) if it if it had pushed a little farther on like why Jim has daddy issues, more, given me more context around what happened there and how he feels about it, mm-hmm. I could have maybe engaged with that final moment on an even higher level. I think it is successful, and I'm, it's good that the movie hinges on that, and that's the big like emotional payoff, because it is still very successful. But I think there's missing pieces along the way that don't amount to it you know, fully knocking me off my feet. I definitely uh, think if it had a second movie like um, Star Lord and Yondu got, then you might actually, which they did have a plan to build that relationship. Well, I think they still could have had that a, a successful full on story here. They had um, in the very intro instead of his mom coming in to tuck him into bed, it was his dad. Mm, yeah, and that then you been had better. the whole like, oh, my dad left. There thing. you go. Yeah, that would then that would uh, m- it, it maybe take... pull a little emotion. Mm-hmm. You think? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it wouldn't take much. Uh, but other than that, I applaud the the animation as we've already done. It, it it's a phenomenal looking film. Uh, it really does blend all of these parts into a cohesive uh, look, and there's no real outstanding ugliness to the movie that we've found in some of our previous ones, at least from an aesthetic standpoint. Sinbad. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Sinbad. Sorry, Sinbad, to throw you under the bus again. (laughs) But uh, yeah, aesthetically great. It's a well-paced movie. It just, I think it's a little hollow until the end where I I do finally start to engage with it on an emotional level. And for that, it earns a 7 out of 10. All right. Mm. Next up, AJ with an 8. Hey. Join the 8 Club. Yeah, um, there's a lot here that on paper and conceptually is great. And that's why it's so high for me. I mean, there's a lot of technical stuff under the hood and that is is visible when you're looking for it. That is really great. And I appreciate that. But like Reese said, there's that emotional, um, I guess, gravity um, that's just not there. Um, I can't really connect or click with a gym. So it's hard for me to follow him into his, his path and his journey. And I'm more enamored by long john silver or um i guess silver here and um then really jim and i i am only on jim's side because i know he's the protagonist right um and so they without investing yourself in the main character it's hard to really fully explore the dynamic of that relationship and all the the complexities of it and to put yourself in the world like i i don't feel like it's atmospheric enough even though it's beautiful to look at like it, it feels 
you know, oddly two dimensional instead of a 3D vast, you know, cosmos mm-hmm. that it should be with all the detail and effort that went into it. And I don't know what, what, what it's missing specifically. I don't know if they're just anchored to the RLS legacy uh, with uh, Stevenson's original novel and they didn't want to uh, tread on that too heavily um, and change it up too much. Um, that that might have been at play there. Um, and I think they, I can't remember if it was this movie uh, with Rocio before he went off to uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, I believe there was it was. Drama there or not. Yeah, I think he had a little bit different vision and he wasn't really being listened to, so he departed and could have been something else too. But um, yeah, it, it's missing a little bit of the heart. Uh, we get to see the emotion, but I don't feel it for me. Uh, so as high as it gets there on a technical level, it's missing some of the, mm-hmm. you know, the gooey stuff, I guess. Um, <laughs> and it was a letdown sentence. because, you know, maybe if I had that nostalgia factor tied into it where I saw it at a younger age, because I do distinctly remember wanting to see this movie because of the look of it and it looked cool. And so it's it's a letdown to see that it didn't turn out to be its full potential. I, I, I think I'm being generous um, just because of what everything that w- went into the production of this yeah. uh, lands it at an eight for me. And I'm fine right. with that. All right. And last but not least, we have Noah with a nine. An, advent- boogie an boogie adventurous? Boogie 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 boogie. An adventurous nine. <laughs> I love your little disclaimers on your score. It's not a disclaimer. It's an addendum. Or an addendum. I don't know. I mean, it doesn't it's affect a... his score, so that's why I call it a disclaimer. It's like what you say before the score. It's flair. Oh, you're Pinash. showing your flair. Uh, yeah. I really like adventure stories. Yeah, as and evident by all of your scores for most of these movies. I, I. That is just my vibe. Yeah, I think Noah and I have Um, matched on most all of these. Yeah, honestly. Yeah, I think we're we've been pretty much the same, and we're we're not looking at each other's scores beforehand. And not gonna lie, I actually was trying to imagine how you were gonna react to this movie. (laughs) I was trying to imagine Reese, you and AJ, like kind of what your aesthetic appeal would be, and I didn't think you were gonna like this one as much. So it makes me happy that you did. You didn't think I would like this one as much? Yeah, I don't know. I just thought maybe that you would have disliked. I don't know. Who do you think I am? You're like, you're not my friend. (laughs) My friend would have known. Yeah, dude. Analyze the things that I like. I'll try to be better. It doesn't have chess. It doesn't have puppets. I love adventure stories. And I love heartfelt moments. And uh, to me, that was this one. Mm-hmm. Because if you sell me on a moment or even a couple moments in a movie, you've got me for the whole movie, despite there being a couple hiccups, that being Ben and the fart monster. <laughs> um, That's a good band name. <laughs> ben, ben and, and the, the fart, fart monster. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, so it's funny. David and I. <laughs> Post grunge fart rock. <laughs> Um, Fart yeah, that's that's yeah. good. That's good. Uh, but yeah, I really enjoyed the whole uh, father son dynamic thing that they had going on with that. I love the whole story of them finding the treasures and mm-hmm. you know just adventuring throughout. Uh, I'm glad they didn't pull any punches as far as killing off certain characters. Not that I want them dead, just the fact that they were okay with you know doing that kind of thing. And I like the score as well. Yeah. All, all of it was really good for me. I didn't have a problem with uh, an emotional connection with the main character. I, I, I was able to empathize with him. Yeah. So I didn't have an issue there. But yeah, I thought I think it's uh, worthy of a nine. All right. So. Nice. Well, I think we, even though it was to varying degrees, I think we all liked this movie. Mm-hmm. Even my lowly seven, I yeah. still consider this a good movie. Well, if that if a seven is the lowest score, yeah. it's doing pretty well. That's a success. I, uh, sorry, thinking about um, retroactively, thinking about Atlantis, I feel like I'd rate that one lower. Yeah, you just gave that one a com- nine, too. Yeah, I, I would retroactively put Atlantis at an eight yeah. because I like this one Um 
a considerable margin more than that one. Yeah, these those two I consider like that's like your double feature there. You've yeah. got you've got one that goes into the earth and one that goes way outside of the earth. Yeah, there you and go. And it's like that they're just kind of two sides of the same yeah. coin. Yeah, and then El Dorado where you go across the earth. Yeah, and they both are kind of yeah. steampunky in a way. Mm, so. That's a benefit of hindsight though, because when you're just getting into a franchise, you kind of just take the first one at face value and enjoy it for what it is and you're really hyped on it so you're like yeah big score yeah and then after going through a few of them you realize man this one's even better but i still wouldn't quite give this a, yep. this one a 10 yeah. so it, that's kind of what it, I was this happens yeah. with the se- when we cover a new series there's mm-hmm. excitement going into the first one where it's like all guns blazing this is yeah. gonna be fun yeah uh and you kind of give it more of the benefit of the doubt yeah agreed all right uh aj do you want to crunch those numbers for us All right, group average is 8.2, so we have a four-way tie. Also with 8.2 is Interview with the Vampire, Die Hard with a Vengeance, The Road to El Dorado, and now Treasure Planet. Ah, same level as Road to El Dorado. Good company. It is good company. I was just going to say that. Uh, Would you put this on the equal ground as El Dorado? This is really tough because... uh, I feel more nostalgic about El Dorado, but I think technically this is a better movie. All right. Okay, let's move on into what the critics thought. Uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, this movie has a 69% with an nice. audience audience score of 72%, and that means it is officially the second movie with a fresh rating out of this whole mini-series of animated films, the other one being Prince of Egypt. Uh, on Metacritic, it has a 60, so it's just barely on the fence there. It's technically a mixed score, but I consider 60 still to be positive because on Metacritic, 61 is positive. So why wouldn't 60 also be positive? It's just stupid. Uh, like 59 seems like the one that's like, okay, now it's a more mixed review. Mm. But uh, yeah, the audience score on that one is 8.3. And the IMDb score, which is an audience-based score, is 7.3. Two. So hmm. overall, mostly positive. Uh, there's a couple of mixed reviews out there. A couple of people were indifferent to this movie's charms, but overall, it is a uh, positive, positively received film. Although, when you actually uh, take into account uh, Clements and Musker's previous work, it is a bit of a step down for them, critically at least. Well, when all of your movies are just like all time classics, runs, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, let's move on to the box office. This movie released on November twenty seventh in two thousand two, and it was playing against uh, the these other new releases: Adam Sandler's Eight Crazy Nights and Solaris, that George Clooney movie. But also playing in the theater at the time uh, were Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Die Another Day, that uh, Pierce Brosnan, uh, James Bond movie, and The Santa Claus 2. It wasn't opening directly against these, but they were really soaking up a lot of the the, the revenue at the Santa time. Santa Claus 2? Yeah. So yeah. I have really, such different perceptions of all of those movies, and yet they're at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. do want to go more into depth a little bit on that, so and let's we, not talk too much. But. Yeah, so uh, this movie was budgeted at $140 million, which is... A huge <sighs> budget a lot. for an animated movie, even at, especially even a at normal the time. movie. No especially wonder it looks time. so good. That's a huge budget a today for an animated yeah. movie. AJ, what do you think the worldwide box office for Treasure Planet is? Uh, I have to recuse myself because I already know the history of okay. the release. Noah. Box office? Mm-hmm. You say? Worldwide. This hurts me, but I think it Arr. didn't make that. I think it didn't make its budget. I think it made like 130 one thirty, yeah. Arena. I actually did see the number on this one. Okay. Oh, you but <laughs> David. I. This is David versus Noah. Yeah. Unless David also looked at the. No, budget. I did. It's a war. I mean, the, the, the or between did, the people that most it. agree with each other. On <laughs> I, the thing podcast. is, I know it failed. That's <laughs> yeah. all I know. So, um, I'm gonna guess eighty. Eighty. Ah. Noah wins. Yeah. You said one hundred thirty. Yeah. Yeah, it, it made 110 million. That's pretty close. 30 million under its budget, which is gosh. If you that know, sucks. like it, I think the marketing for this one also cost 40 million, so it, even it's actually more 180 fail. million. Even more. Uh, and and I would say at the time, this one of one would have needed to probably double its budget to be successful, and it didn't even 
match it. So it did especially bad domestically. Like it did a little better overseas. It made like 71 million. Uh, domestically, it only made 38 million, which yeah, is so ridiculous. Yeah, it's terrible. It had an yeah. awful opening and it just crumbled from there. I have a uh, prediction and I think Disney was like, Go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Well, you're on the right track. Yeah. Um, uh, for once, maybe I will turn this over to David since you're so passionate about the, the franchise side of yeah. this one. Uh, so so tell us, uh, what's going on with Treasure Planet? Why, why do we not have a Treasure Planet 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Spin 8, 9, 10? Spin-off TV series. Yeah. yeah, video games. Well, actually, there was a video game. But anyway, yeah. well, so to back up a little bit, when it came to deciding the franchise as a whole, uh, I went with this sort of Dark Horse animated early 2000s series because there was a video that I watched um, about why this failed, why Treasure Planet failed. And there is it's more of a conspiracy theory, really, um, because obviously there's no way to you know vehemently say like that is exactly what happened. But uh, it inspired me to look more into these movies and... Like what happened to 2D animation? And you're gonna give them a throw out? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, plug. Uh, yeah. So um, the the I think the video is actually called um, "Treasure Planet: Disney's Biggest Mistake," and gotcha. it's by Bread Sword. Um, check it out. His channel is amazing. He does a lot of different movies. I think Treasure Planet was the first movie he did. It actually blew up because mm-hmm. it was yeah. really good and it was very in depth. And um, but and I want to use some of what he said at the end of his video here because I think he more eloquently states it. So Reese, you can sort of put him in here. You'll send me that link. Yep. <laughs> and then if we don't get to use that audio and it yeah. just doesn't work, I already wrote this out, so I'll read it out and kind of go from there. Nice, nifty. So to sum up the the concept of what happened and why this failed. So why was Treasure Planet a flop? And this is the quote. Yeah. Uh, I. Paraphrase, took it, and put it in my own words. Okay, cool. So why was it a flop? Disney could sell wood to a forest. They're a well-known force for making sure people know that their stuff is coming out. Uh, Lilo and Stitch had multiple marketing campaigns working six months before the movie even had a trailer, letting everyone know, this is what you're going to go see. Mm. McDonald's had Happy Meal toys, the whole shebang. So they released at the start of the summer, right when kids were getting out of school. The other highest movie it was competing against was the live-action Scooby-Doo. So guess what? Of course it's going to do better. Yeah. So Treasure Planet, though, as we know now, went against Harry Potter and Santa Claus 2, which is another yep. it was another Disney movie. Why would they put them out the same weekend? Why Christmas time? It's, it's such a weird thing. So both of which sat at number one, by the way, Harry Potter and Santa Claus 2 on their opening weekends. So Disney just decided to release a kid's movie that's obviously a summer movie based on all of their other track records, and they decided to put it out at Christmas competing against some of their other highest grossing movie weekends of all time. So the Santa and Claus the marketing. specifically that being a Disney property yes. at the time. So there were some marketing campaigns for treasure planet, but they were either of Jim on his solar surfer, which was just kind of nothing or just a full synopsis of the movie full of spoilers. So Disney had a marketing, they had a marketing survey Four months before the release of the movie, and it wasn't really testing well. So they were like, okay, why aren't people interested in this movie? And the reason people stated isn't exactly what you would think. You would think like, oh, they just didn't like the movie. Well, actually, the reason they stated that they didn't want to go see it was because they kind of caught on to Disney's pattern for releasing. And they're like, okay, this is going against these movies. If they release it on DVD, which was just starting to become a trend, and Disney was mm. pushing out DVDs, so like, okay, that's going to be DVD out in the sequels, spring. You mean like that they would make like Tarzan two and like yeah, no, the yeah. physical and, media release, and, really and they would release in the spring, early summer. So they're like, yeah, I'm just going to go check it out on DVD. So people figured that I could just go wait, and so Disney knew what they were doing. They could have pushed the movie's release forward or backward a little bit to make sure it wasn't competing against other heavy hitters, but they didn't. And they, mm. put, and they put it there on purpose to let it flounder. So the reason was pretty clear. The 3D animated movies that were all out at the time were doing great, and the studios in charge at the time were not the same ones who gave the original green light to Clemens and Musker. So the, the 2D animation mixed with deep canvas was really expensive, as we saw, and they wanted to shift more towards 3D, which was less expensive. Treasure Planet already had a sequel in the works. It was actually a year into the works they had voice acting they were just entering pre-production 
I mean, they did a lot of yeah. work. Willem Dafoe was cast as the villain. Yeah, he was. Oh, he Iron good. Beard. Iron yeah. Beard, yeah. They they had the whole thing fleshed out. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, but then they got the news that they had to cancel it because of this. Um, so they already had that in the works. Um, but what better way to like not honor your word of getting that sequel than just killing it yourself and then going, well, it didn't do well, so can't get all the other stuff we promised. Yeah. So, I mean, the movie scored well critically, as we saw. I mean, a lot better than I think the box office shows. And it was even nominated for Best Picture or Best Animated Picture at the Oscars that year. Hey, good for them. But who knows? Maybe Disney wasn't as aware as, you know, I'm kind of making them sound a little bit. Maybe, you know, that just happens. You know, there are other movies that are good that just happen to fail. Iron Giant, Road to El Dorado. Both of those pretty good movies. They they ranked really well critically. Pretty good. Yeah, they're amazing. I love them both. But both of them tanked Iron in the box Giant. office. Mm. Yeah. Iron Giant especially failed, which is crazy to me. Yeah, yeah, that's insane. But sometimes movies that are amazing tank. You know, who knows? That's that's my spiel. Uh, I, li- I like it. I mean, I don't like what happened, but that's a, doesn't that's a it good seem spiel. doesn't it seem like they made that it, happen? It it feels like it does seem weird. It's it intentional. feels like not not so much yeah, that what? they made it happen, but they didn't try. To well, push it out there. If they didn't make it happen, a lot of those marketing choices sound really poor. Like releasing Treasure Planet during the holiday break. Yeah. Like that That movie screams summer movie. Yeah, to it's me. summer blockbuster uh, movie. <laughs> but I there's another side of this though that I'm like the movie cost $140 million and you're not going to market the hell out of it. Yeah, like, right. yeah. I, that, it's, it, that seems weird. Well, See, part of the theory is that they allowed the budget to balloon just so they could say, look, this is too expensive. It's not efficient. We're going to yeah. move to a different... And yeah. you know, everyone we're, we're knows put, like Disney has enough money to take a bath. Like that, It's just... Yeah, maybe it's <laughs> to keep Clements and Musker under lock and key doing what they want them to yeah, do maybe, versus these, these maybe. ambitious side projects. They're like, that, yeah, we let you do it. Now go do your other now, stuff. No, they're now and they're like, now you see how that worked out, guys. This is why we make the Little Mermaid. <laughs> this is why we make Aladdin. Not your silly little steampunk adventure movie. Uh, uh, yeah, what? It, it does kind of feel like that, doesn't it? Why do they try so hard for those titles that, honestly, you look at the bare bones story, it's not that great. Yeah. And then for something that's super ambitious and really exciting, they're like, eh, we'll put out a trailer. Yeah. <laughs> and place it between two huge blockbusters. That said, I I don't want to completely throw Disney under the bus mm. because no, they, they deserve did, it. They market they marketed the crap out of Atlantis and there was a, that was a similar type of situation where it was directors who were like, Well, we want to make this Atlantis thing. We've been wanting to do this. It's like is kind of a passion play, mm-hmm. uh, and that one kind of fell on its face, both critically and financially. Uh, so yeah. it's kind of hard to say. And I, that was so like two years before this one. My 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 brain is here. This is in your head. Disney, if they want something to be successful, it'll be successful. That was the whole point yeah. of the thing I said. They could sell wood to a forest. Yeah, they, they wanted. Uh, the, I'm gonna it, I'm gonna disagree slightly. I mean, you've got Lone Ranger, John Carter. Uh, Prince of Persia. Yeah, I don't think they wanted those to be successful. No, they made one after the other. Like, I know. Oh, come on, I, please. I, I have a feeling that perhaps it's you know an executive there that wants these movies, and the the real high like the main or a lot of the other higher ups are like, eh, maybe okay, fine, whatever, we'll let you do your thing, and uh, then they let it happen, but they kind of quash it. It's almost like Marvel. You know? you know, they don't make really bad Marvel movies. Yeah, and if they did, though, you'd be like, what? Yeah, look. Uh, <laughs> Look at, look at Thor: The Dark World or uh, Iron Man Two. Iron Iron Man Two. Look Captain at Marvel, uh, Captain Marvel. All of those did really well box office, but you have to say they're not great movies. Yeah. I I won't say they're bad, but, that would but they're say not. That they great. knew what they're doing marketing wise. But yeah, exactly. They marketed them extremely well. Yeah, and well, they uh, made th- lots. But of I money. also think like. Disney has since honed their craft of marketing. Like it's like this, it's this assembly line that they know exactly how to do it. But now. they, they still, but they, they had that track that. record before that. Well, no, even, no, no. This was still an un- uncertain. Like the Disney Renaissance was like this. It was like a really long, but still flash in the pan. Where it was like Disney was floundering. They were doing things like Black Cauldron and all these like kind I of love odd, Black with these Muskers odd, and Clement were a part of. Yeah. 
But but like the Disney Renaissance was like, okay, there's hope for Disney again. Like they were not like this righted ship that we associate with now, where it's just they just bleed success. Uh, but that was the whole point of the Lilo and Stitch comment was that they had that marketing campaign planned. Like they had the whole thing mapped out. But this this came out afterward. Yeah. Well, here's the thing: is the motivation, like Reese, what you just said, the argument, you know, that's part of the thing is they saw that the game had changed. They have competition now. Yeah. Like they can't just sit on their laurels. They have to keep up with the meta and go with oh, the I new hate metas. They yeah. they go with the new trend of uh, you know three yeah, D animation. No, yeah, it's weird. I do I do buy into a lot of this theory of them just like shutting off uh, Treasure Planet from success but i also don't think they wanted it to fail because like what company wants their now, movie to completely the, fail? right the, the point being that they don't necessarily want it to fail but they don't want to represent it because they think it's not they don't have a lot of confidence in yeah. it. yeah no I, i'm with you reese i think there's more nuance like yeah i mean there's suspicious activity for sure and this is a giant corporation that is known to do some shady stuff um, but you know, they still want to make money as much as possible, but mm. yeah. <sighs> yeah. Right. I, I, I'm I, sorry. I'm in agreement. I, I think that if it was going to be, or if they, if it was going to be successful, they would funnel that, they'd push that money right up, yeah. right up it. So I also think <laughs> but, like if you, you were know. to take treasure planet, I do think there's a better movie in there. Yeah. Like I don't think it's a masterpiece. Yeah. If it had been, I guarantee it would have been a lot more successful. Yeah. Because, you know, Santa Claus 2 is great and all, but it's a sequel. Sequels are yeah. never like quite as thrilling as something that's new and fresh, you know. So I I just can't imagine that it was necessarily forced to, you know, commit suicide. It it's just that that may have been a factor, but you we all have to agree there is something an element missing to it. Like yeah. there there's something missing. It was yeah. a ambitious, well executed project, right. but flawed. Right. Exactly. All right. So that closes out our discussions on Treasure Planet. Uh, do you buy into that conspiracy or not? Who knows? Uh, give us your thoughts. Uh, and that means it is now officially AJ's turn, and he has submitted for us the next mini series that we will be covering. And this one will be Vigilantes. Me. So this one's going to be another kind of mixed, not mixed bag. Wait, cr- sorry, is it Vigilantes or is it Hitmen? It, it's Hitmen slash Vigilantes, correct, okay. AJ? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to pin down. I mean, once we see the movies, there's kind of more of a theme i just didn't know how to describe it, up, it more yeah. accurately okay. <laughs> yeah because there's a ton of vigilante movies out there yeah so uh so we're not going to reveal all we have in our deck of cards here but we will reveal the first two films that we'll be covering well the first one but then you'll know exactly what's coming after it and that is the equalizer starring denzel washington and this will kind of ease our way nicely into this uh, this subgenre of films. Uh, I'm excited, guys. Are y'all excited? I am too. I don't know. Yeah, because I've never seen these. Always heard they were good. Yeah. So we generally like to start off a mini series with uh, kind of a, a palate cleanse, and the Equalizer seems like a good one to do that with. Though we will give it, you know, as much attention and love as we do any film on this show. So uh, we will do it justice. I haven't seen the Equalizer, so. Looking forward to it. But we've got some some serious heavy hitters in this one after uh, that that uh, we are excited to uh, announce as well. But we will we will keep you in suspense. With that said, one last thing that we skipped over um, is the um, whether or not the movie... What honorable it? or dishonorable? Uh, there you go. Death? I couldn't remember the word. Oh, yeah. Hella honorable. Yeah. Uh, so for those of y'all that, that, that don't know, and I, I, I forget this when we do the, the one-offs. because I, mean, mm. I usually We did like them on this. all of them. No, I know, but I always forget because I, I usually just associate yeah. it with, with it being at the end of a franchise. And technically, all of these are the end of a franchise, just a franchise of one film. Uh, but yeah, honorable or dishonorable death is a segment of this podcast where we deem a film honorable or dishonorable in terms of uh, whether it leaves 
any loose ends that uh, demand a sequel. And if they do leave loose ends, it is a dishonorable death. And if they close the loop successfully and don't beg for a sequel, that means it is an honorable death and can stand on its own two feet. Uh, so, Planet Treasure... Treasure Planet, God. I can't. <laughs> so hey, treasure, almost done. Yeah, Treasure Planet. Honorable or dishonorable? I think we all agree. Honorable. In honorable. honorable. Yeah. I think it's an honorable death for this one. AJ, you agree? Yep. Yes. Can we, can we add in some sort of sound effect for dishonorable movies that's like, a, like wah, an execution? Wah, wah. Like, no, like a... <laughs> Oh, you in know. which case, can we have an honorable sound too, where it's like confetti and like, hey, like the, that, that sound the, uh, from Halo, the, the great yeah. confetti? Oh my yeah. gosh, I forgot about <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, all right, honorable death for Treasure Planet. Would have loved to see more, but at least this one ends satisfyingly. Amen, right. sister. And that leads us to our last thing. Uh, looks like we are going to try to set up a Patreon here pretty soon. And we've got some ideas for content for, uh, or at least Patreon content. And we are basically going to be doing or adding a little rewards show at the end of a, a mini series. So these past six films that we've covered, all these animated films, we are going to hold a, a mini awards show. And, you know, as meaningless as it is, we are going to award these movies some stuff. Yeah, like the Oscars. Yeah, it's it's like our own little every two months Oscars show. We need to make some some stickers for those that attend. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a and it could be fun. And we're we will probably release the first couple of these on the main feed just so y'all can get a taste of what it'll be like and if you want to uh, invest in something like that. So the the first one or two will be freebies. Sound good? Sounds Amen. good. All right, and uh, look forward to that. In the probably we'll release it a few days after the the main episode comes out. So mm, let's say Friday. All right. Yeah. All right. And with that, let's close out this episode. Goodbye, guys. Bye. Later. Goodbye. They're a ludicrous parcel of driveling galoots, ma'am. There you go. <laughs> Poetry. <laughs>